Okay, so we're going to talk about the brain and the um, cranial nerves. We're going to start by just going over just the basic um, parts of the brain. And then at the end, we'll talk about the cranial nerves. All right, so basically, um, some review for you. We had talked about in general A&P the cerebrum. This is the cerebrum. That's the largest part. We talked about the cerebellum, which is the second largest part. We talked about the diencephalon, and the diencephalon contained the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the epithalamus. And then we also talked about the brainstem. And the brainstem includes the mesencephalon, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. And many times we call the mesencephalon the midbrain, right? So we're going to go through the main nuclei and tracts that are in each one of these areas and, you know, what happens. Now, um, the thing with the, thing with the um, brain is that at the lowest area of, this, of the brain stem, that's the medulla oblongata, that's the most primitive area of your brain. So that's really controlling just the most basic, fundamental functions in your body, right? Which would be what? What's the most basic, fundamental thing that keeps you alive? Breathing, Breathing and your heart, right? Those two things. Now, as we go further up, we get more complicated. And by the time we get into, like, the hypothalamus and then the cerebrum up in here, um, that's where it gets even more complicated and we start talking about emotions and intelligence and just uh, much more complicated um, thought processes go on in those areas. So we're going to work our way up. We're going to start in the medulla oblongata, then we're going to go to the pons, then we're going to go to the midbrain, then to the diencephalon. Uh, we'll take a look at the cerebellum to see how that's functioning, and then the cerebrum. Okay. Now, I just want to review quickly the, um, we have these ventricles. And so the ventricles are these cavities, these open cavities inside the brain. We have the lateral ventricles that are in the right and the left cerebral hemispheres. We have the third ventricle, which surrounds the thalamus or the diencephalon. And then we have the fourth ventricle that's in between the pons and the cerebellum, right? And so what flows inside there? Cerebral spinal fluid, right? So cerebral spinal fluid is produced and it flows through these ventricles, right? And so it's carrying away wastes, it's delivering nutrients, um, it has ions um, in it and lots of fluid. So it's, it's just kind of um, replenishing the brain, here's what they look like from the front. We can see, you know, we can see the lateral ventricles. Now we can see that there's two lateral ventricles. We can see the one third ventricle and we can see the one fourth ventricle, right? I also want to go briefly over the um, the meninges. So there are cranial meninges that surround the brain, just like there were spinal meninges that surrounded the spinal cord, but there's just a little difference with this. Um, when we look at the um, pia mater, we're going to kind of blow this picture up here so you can see what's going on here. Um, the pia mater, just like in the spinal cord, the pia mater is tightly adhered to the brain, right? So in the spinal cord, it was tightly adhered to the spinal cord. In the brain, there's the pia mater tightly um, adhering to that. And then we have this subarachnoid space. And arachnoid means spider. So you see kind of like a spider web formation going on in there. So that's a subarachnoid space. And then we have the arachnoid mater, right? So then we have this area right here, which is the arachnoid mater. Right? Then we have the dura mater. 
there's a space, and then um, the subdural space, which normally is not there in a healthy person, and then you have the dura mater. Now, the difference is the dura mater around the brain has two layers to it. So there's an, there's an inner layer, and then there's an outer layer, right? So here's, here's the, what we call the meningeal layer. Right there, it's just an inner layer. And then here we have an outer layer that's called endosteal. Endosteal just means um, bone, but we'll just call it inner and outer. And in between the two, we have a blood vessel there. Um, it's, it's called the dural sinus is the um, space that it's called, and the superior sagittal, si um, superior sagittal sinus is the same as the dural sinus. So you might remember that from, the, um, from general a &P, right? And then we have a blood vessel in there. Okay, so we're going to take a look at that again when we look at the formation of cerebral spinal fluid. So in this area um, here, this is blood. And then in the, in the space here, the subarachnoid space, this here is cerebral spinal fluid. Okay? So there's a thing called the blood-brain barrier, and that's what we're going to go over next. Um, <clears throat> Let's talk about cerebral spinal fluid first. Okay. So if we look inside this third ventricle, right in here, this is the third ventricle surrounding the, the diencephalon. There's a structure in there that's called the um, choroid plexus, the choroid plexus. So here we see the choroid plexus of the third ventricle. And in that choroid plexus are a lot of cells that are called um, ependymal cells. And ependymal cells are the cells that produce cerebral spinal fluid. So they're in these, this choroid plexus, and then we can see that the third ventricle moves down to the fourth ventricle, and then the fourth ventricle moves down into the um, spinal cord, into that central canal of the spinal cord. And the central canal of the spinal cord is lined by these ependymal cells as well, right? So we have cerebral spinal fluid being produced in the third ventricle, and then also in the spinal cord, and the cerebral spinal fluid is going to flow through all these open areas, right? Turn. Doesn't want to turn on me. I guess that's the way it is. All right, so this is the flow. This is what really happens. There's the, the fluid is going to move from the third ventricle down through the aqueduct into the fourth ventricle. And then um, from the fourth ventricle, it's going to flow into the central canal of the spinal cord. And then it's going to reach the tip, and it's going to come all the way around through that subarachnoid space. So we're going to get lots of um, fluid flowing uh, around the brain that way. It's going to come up, and it's just going to flow all the way around the brain that way. But in addition to that, when the cerebral spinal fluid gets into the fourth ventricle here, there are a couple of holes in there that are called apertures. And, you know, holes, if you just remember the word aperture, means a hole. And the, um, the fluid will flow through those holes and into the subarachnoid space that way as well. Okay? So both ways... The cerebral spinal fluid is going to flow through the ventricles, through the central canal, and it's going to flow all the way around the brain. So the inside and the outside of the brain is going to receive this cerebral spinal fluid. Okay. All right, so we don't really want a lot of um, movement of things between the blood and um, the brain. Uh, so there's this thing called the blood-brain barrier, right? 
there's two different barriers in the brain. The first barrier is called the blood-brain barrier, and that's a barrier between the um, brain capillaries in here and the neurons. Because you don't want a lot of toxins or drugs from the blood to get into where those neurons are and attack those neurons. We don't want that. So there's this blood-brain barrier. And so the two things that are going to create that barrier are number one, these endothelial cells of the blood vessel, right? So these are the cells that line the blood vessel. And those are called endothelial cells. So that's number one, what helps to create that blood-brain barrier. Okay. Um, and in addition to that, we have these other cells that are called the oligodendrocytes. Hang on a second. Let's see that. Let's see, I'm on the first page still of your notes, so we haven't gone any further than that. Not the only, the astrocytes. So then we have these other cells in here that are called the astrocytes. And these astrocytes have these little foot petals that are also going to spread out on the outside of that blood vessel and they create yet another barrier. Oligodendrocytes <coughs> create myelin. These are the astrocytes. So we have astrocytes and endothelial cells that create this barrier. So very limited things can go through that blood-brain barrier. Um, like tetracycline can't go through that blood-brain barrier. Right? There is a drug, an antibiotic, um, sulfadiazine, um, that can cross it, but otherwise, you know, we have to have like a lipid antibiotic to get through that blood-brain barrier because those endothelial cells that surround that blood vessel are, have phospholipid bilayer, right? <coughs> Most, a lot of times what has to happen in the brain in order for you to get medication from the blood into the brain you have to wait until whatever disorder or disease, like meningitis, right, infection, breaks down that blood-brain barrier enough so that you can actually get medications across um, to heal and to um, kill off any of those bac uh, bacteria, okay? There's also a blood cerebral spinal fluid barrier because we also wouldn't want anything in the blood getting into the ventral, you know, the ventricles. And so the blood CSF barrier is created by the ependymal cells. And like I told you, it's those ependymal cells that produce the cerebral spinal fluid. Well, here they are also creating a barrier so that um, things from the blood can't get across, right? So they can't get across. So you just want to know the difference. What's creating the blood-brain barrier? What's creating the blood CSF barrier? All right? Okay. Any questions on that? Now we're going to move on. Can you keep that up here? I can. Yeah, you bet. All good? Okay. All right, so let's move on then. Let's start by looking at the brainstem. And so we're going to look at, we're going to start by looking at 
the medulla oblongata. So when we look at this picture here, okay, we can see this down here is the medulla oblongata. So this kind of reddish area, that's the medulla oblongata. And it is continuous with the spinal cord. So they're one and the same, right? They're, they're connected to each other. They're not one and the same. They're just connected to each other, okay? So the nerves that are coming off of the medulla oblongata, those are going to be called cranial nerves. And the nerves coming off of the spinal cord, those are called spinal nerves. So we differentiate them right there, all right? Now, we know that there's 12 pairs of cranial nerves. So the medulla oblongata is going to contain the highest number of cranial nerves. And so cranial nerves, um, we have cranial nerves 5 through, um, I'm sorry, 8 through 12 that come off of the medulla oblongata. 9 through 12. 9 through 12. So here you can see, and this is, you just can't see that number very well, but that's supposed to be 9. So 9 through 12 come off of the medulla oblongata. 9 through 12 control the muscles in your pharynx. We're going to go through these individually, so you're going to know what they are at the end. We're going to go through with a chart. But basically, um, the neck and like the shoulder area. Okay, 9 through 12 are going to control those. So your tongue muscle, your throat muscles, your shoulder muscles, your neck muscles. But we'll go through each one of those individually when we get there. All right. There's some other things, too, that I need you to know about in the um, medulla oblongata. So I did do some drawings. I'm not wild about my drawings. But I think I'm going to go to them just because I have written down what each one of these things are that we have in the medulla oblongata. Okay, so um, we can see, first of all, there's this, this long thing here that's called the reticular formation this thing right here, it actually is a tract that runs all the way from the medulla oblongata up until we get to that midbrain. So it's going to go up through the pons, up until we get into the midbrain, and we're really going to talk about it more then. But it does have some centers where um, it controls basic things like posture, breathing, um, body temperature, uh, sleep. So there's some things that are controlled in there, but I, for our purposes, I'm not going to ask you what the reticular formation does in the medulla oblongata, right? You just need to know that's where it starts, and then it's going to go up until it gets to the midbrain. But we do have some other centers here in the medulla oblongata um, that are very important. We have the cardiovascular center. Okay, the cardiovascular center deals with the heart, and it will increase the heart rate, and it will increase the contractility of the heart, right? It doesn't set the pace for the heart. What sets the pace for the heart? The SA node, right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we have the cardiovascular center. In addition to that, we have a respiratory center. So there's respiratory centers. And there are cardiovascular centers here. Respiratory centers are, the respiratory center is going to control the rhythm of respiration. Like, what's your rhythm? How many in? How many seconds in? How many seconds out? How many seconds in? How many, okay, so it's going to just kind of control the rhythm. Now it does, it's going to receive input from the pons, but we'll talk about the pons in just a minute. And then um, the last thing that I want you to know, well, there's two other things really that I'm going to have you know about the medulla oblongata. The next thing is that, and I told you that cranial nerves 9 through 12 exit the medulla, so that's important to know. 
okay? And then you're going to see these terms down here, the cuneate nucleus and the gracile nucleus. Those are areas that receive sensory information. Okay, so there's the cuneate and the gracilis, or the gracile. They receive sensory information. They receive, the sensory information that they receive is like touch. It's going to receive touch, vibration, proprioception. So all, a lot of general senses, right? It's going to receive a lot of these general senses. And the reason why I want you to know them is because we're going to talk about these tracks in Chapter 15 that lead up to those. Okay? Now, the difference between the two is that the gracile nucleus is receiving um, information from your lower body, so like your legs and your trunk, whereas the cuneate nucleus is receiving that type of information from your upper body. So when you try to think of ways to memorize this grace, grace, graceful, she's graceful when she walks, right? So just come up with little ways to memorize these things. All right, so that's our um, medulla oblongata. There's a couple of other nuclei in there. I'm not going to go through all of those because we've got a lot of other things we have to cover. All right, then we're going to look at the pons, and the pons is right above the medulla oblongata. And again, right away, we can see that reticular formation continues. It's going to go right up through that pons. And the pons has a few things that I want you to know, remember. remember. Um, first of all, it has this apneustic and pneumotaxic centers. These are respiratory centers. We're going to hear about them again when we get to the respiratory system. They adjust what the respiratory center is doing in the medulla. They adjust the medulla. That's their job, to adjust the medulla, the respiratory, the respiratory centers in the medulla. There's also cranial nerves that are coming off of the pons, and we have cranial nerves 5 through 8, 5 through 8. So if we think about 5 through 8, if you remember, there's um, 8 is vestibulocochlear, so that's going to be hearing and balance, and we're going to go through the other ones in 5. 5 is um, trigeminal. So it's going to, we're going to look at, you know, sensation on the face. We're going to look at uh, muscles of mastication. But just know cranial nerves 5 through 8 come off of the pons. Okay, and in addition to that, um, there are these, um, there's cerebellar nuclei, and then there are pontine fibers. So... I want to go back and look at this other slide to show you what's going on there. Let's see. You guys have any questions? Got it? Got it? Okay. So then we finally get to the midbrain, and we'll talk about the midbrain first, and then we'll go into the cerebellum after that. So in the midbrain, I actually don't like that picture. This is going to be a little bit better here. Okay. So this is basically saying the cerebellum sits right behind the pons, right? So if you remember, I when I was talking about the uh, fourth ventricle, I said the fourth ventricle sits right in between the pons and the cerebellum. So this is the pons, and then this back here is the cerebellum, right? So the pons is kind of like a passageway. It's a highway, if you will, 
And so there are some um, interconnections between the cerebellum and all the way up to the cerebrum. And there are interconnections from the cerebellum all the way down through the brainstem uh, or to the medulla. And that has to occur through the pons. It has to go through the pons, right? Bless you. In addition, there are just fibers going from the pons itself back to the cerebellum, and those are called the pontine fibers. So we've got the pontine fibers that just connect the pons to the cerebellum, and then we have these other tracts, which are called cerebellar tracts, and they lead from the cerebellum to elsewhere in the brain and the brainstem. Okay? So that's, that's the pons. All right, let's see what other pictures I have here. Ah, there we go. The midbrain is going to sit right above the, um, the pons, and the midbrain has an area that's called the um, corpora quadragemina. Corpora quadragemina. Okay, so this is the midbrain. Corpora means body. Quadra Gemina. Okay. And um, within the corpora, so the, the um, eh, you know, if we wanted to talk about like a roof and a floor, um, the roof of the midbrain is called the tectum, and then the, the um, floor is called the tegmentum. And the corpora quadra Gemina is in the tectum just words, right? And within the corpora um, quadragemina are these two nuclei. One is called the superior colliculus, and one is called the inferior colliculus. Okay? So these two are, you know, we're still in the brainstem area, these two are related to reflexes. The superior colliculus is, a, um, is going to control a visual reflex, whereas the inferior colliculus is going to control an auditory reflex. Okay. So what do I mean by that? So the um, superior colliculus, if you see a bright light, you flinch away from it, right? You're gonna flinch away from it. That's a reflex. If you um, hear a loud noise, then the inferior colliculus receives that information and it's gonna cause you to jump, right? Okay, so I have a video. Okay, now let's talk about the tegmentum. So the tegmentum is the floor of the midbrain, and it contains, um, it contains the red nucleus, and it contains the substantia nigra. So I'm just trying to pull things out of the brain that I think is, are going to be the most applicable. The red nucleus uh, is red. It's actually a very red um, area that is going to, um, it has a lot of blood vessels in it. That's what makes it really red. And it um, controls subconscious motor commands to your upper body. Okay, just to your upper body. Subconscious motor commands. So motor commands that you do with your arm without even thinking about it, right? You just kind of, uncomfortable and you just kind of, you, you move your hands, you move your arm, right? So it's subconscious control. 
the substantia nigra, nigra meaning black, is a very dark area, and the substantia nigra releases dopamine. Dopamine. Now, we've mentioned dopamine before as a neurotransmitter. Okay? Dopamine, we're going to see, inhibits this other area called the basal um, nuclei. So we'll talk about how that works when we get to the basal nuclei. Okay. So a person that has Parkinson's disease, they are not going to be secreting dopamine in the proper um, amount that they should be. All right. So that'll make more sense once we get to the basal nuclei and we talk about that. Okay, the other thing that the midbrain contains that I want you to remember is the reticular activating system. Do you guys remember that from general ANP? What does the reticular activating system do? Keeps you conscious. That's right, it keeps you conscious. So a person that's in a coma, their RAS is not functioning, right? They're not conscious. Also in the midbrain, cranial nerves three and four exit from the midbrain. What do three and four do? Do you remember? Oculomotor, trochlear, eyeball movements, right? We're going to go over those, like I said, at the end. How are my people in my front row doing with my break time? <laughs> Really? Okay. We did, but then we did the cahoots? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's keep going. All right, so now let's get to, I just want to make sure, because I see some people <coughs> going, oh. So I'm going to go to that first page here that I have on your drawings if you want to draw. And we're looking down here. The diencephalon is made up of, um, it's above the brain stem. So it's right above that mesencephalon, right above that midbrain. And it has three areas to it. One area is called the hypothalamus. Hypo means below the thalamus, hypothalamus. The biggest area is called the thalamus, and we're going to look more closely at that. And then there's an area that's called the epithalamus. Epi means on top of, and it's really not on top of it, but it's kind of right, right, right behind it. Um, and it contains a gland called the pineal gland. So um, let's go over what each one of those things do. Let's start with the epithalamus, which contains the pineal gland. Do you remember what the pineal gland secretes? Melatonin. It secretes melatonin, and what does melatonin do? Yeah, it, it sets your um, sleep cycle. So it's released about an hour before you go to bed, and it makes you sleepy, and then um, the... Um, Melatonin drops throughout the night, and then eventually you wake up in the morning, right? All right, so that's the, that is the epithalamus. Now, the thalamus, uh, this is, the, we always call it the final relay station, but it's just a little bit more complicated than that. It has some other things in it. Uh, in general, ANP, we just told you it was the final relay station. And what that means is that every single sensory information that you have, whether it's coming in through your cranial nerves or in through your spinal nerves, it has to stop in the thalamus before it goes to your cerebrum where it becomes, you become aware of it. Every sensory information, except for, 
What sensation does not have to stop in the thalamus? Olfactory. The olfactory sensation, the sense of smell, goes straight back to the olfactory cortex. It does not have to stop in the thalamus, but everything else does. Does a reflex stop in the thalamus? Um, what, like a cranial reflex? Are you talking about a reflex? So there's different areas throughout the brainstem that um, have to do with reflexes. So we talked about like the colliculi, they're for visual and auditory reflexes. Um, so there's different reflexes. And as we go through, we're gonna talk about these reflexes, but the thalamus is really a relay station. That's all it is. It's taking information in, synapsing, and then sending it off. And it has a couple other functions. So we're gonna end up talking about um, those other functions as well, right? So let's look at that thalamus. Oh, there was my midbrain area. Um, let me just check, I want to just check your lab list here to see if any of these are on your lab exam. They used to be, and we took a lot of things off of the lab exam. So you have to be able to identify the cerebrum, cerebral hemispheres, we'll talk about both hemispheres in a bit, the cerebellum, the midbrain, or mesencephalon, don't put a slash, don't put both. Pons, medulla oblongata, lateral ventricle, third ventricle, cerebral aqueduct between those ventricles, the fourth ventricle, and then the central canal of the spinal cord. Okay. Oh, they do have the falx cerebelli, the tentorium cerebelli, and the falx cerebelli. So I do have to go over those things, I guess. Dura mater of the brain, arachnoid mater of the brain, pia mater of the brain. All right. So let me go over those um, those uh, dural folds. I don't even have a picture of the dural folds. Oh, there's all these pictures. All right, so there are um, extensions of the dura mater are called dural folds. And these are going to be on your lab list. They're on your lab list, so you have to know them. So the dura mater is the outermost, hardest, uh, toughest layer. And the if I'm looking at the um, cerebrum from the back, there's this, the two cerebral hemispheres. And if we look at that from the back, so the dura mater covers the top of it, and the dural fold that comes in a little bit like that and back out again, um, that fold right there is called the falx cerebri. And what this dural fold does is it just kind of uh, seat belts the cerebral hemispheres down. It acts like a seat belt to hold them down. Right? Then we have the cerebellum, and the cerebellum has, is smaller, but it basically has two hemispheres as well. And so we have this smaller dural fold that fits in between those two, and we call that the falx cerebelli. Again, it seat belts down that cerebellum, just seat belts it down. And then finally, we have um, the last dural fold that is kind of a tent over the top of the um, cerebellum and it separates the cerebellum for the, from the cerebrum, uh, and that is called the tentorium cerebelli, tentorium cerebelli. So it's kind of like a tent over the top of the um, cerebellum. So that doesn't look like the picture that you're gonna see. I didn't download that because I, we had that in general a &P and I didn't think that it was on your lab list, so I didn't download that picture, but you can look at it picture that you see is going to be from the side <clears throat> and it's not going to have the cerebrum or the cerebellum in there at all it's just going to show the flap going down and then the small one in between the cerebellum and then the tentorium one so okay but um, otherwise you guys are lucky you don't have to name any of these other areas that I thought you were going to have to do that we took out we took them all out so okay
So let's look at the cerebellum then. Okay, you guys remember the cerebellum. It sits right behind the pons. It sits right behind the fourth ventricle. If I blow this up and we look inside the cerebellum, we can see that there's a white matter in there that looks like, it looks like a, a, a tree, actually. So that white matter we call the arbor vitae, arbor vitae, right? That's just the white matter. And the, the um, cerebellum, its function, it has a couple of functions. First thing it does is it adjusts postural muscles. You know, when you're sitting there or when I'm standing here and I'm maintaining a posture, my muscles are constantly contracting and then relaxing. There's some that are contracting, some that are relaxing, but then when I shift, other ones have to contract, other ones have to relax. So we're constantly adjusting those postural muscles all the time. So that's one um, function of the cerebellum. The second function of the cerebellum is that it refines learned movements. What's a learned movement that you have? Sure, walking, running, riding a bike, any of those things are learned movements, right? They're learned movements. So if we have damage to the cerebellum, a person is going to, they're, they're going to have um, a wide stance because they're not going to feel like they have um, the postural ability. They don't have the ability to adjust their posture. So they're going to have this wide stance, and then they're going to be rocking, rocking a lot, right? And if you have them walk a straight line, they're not going to be able to do it. So let's just take a quick look at a video. Okay, now we're going to look at, we're going to go up higher yet, and we're going to look at an area that's called the diencephalon. Okay, so this is showing just where the thalamus is. Now, if we look at it down here, all right, the thalamus is actually divided into like a right and a left. Um, the third ventricle sort of goes right through it and around it. So uh, it's one thalamus, but it's kind of separated into two separate lobes, right? So when it's separated out, this is just showing one of them, one side of the thalamus. And there are, um, there's the anterior group and the medial group. And those pretty much deal with emotions. So there's a very fine border between the, um, between the thalamus um, and the um, limbic system. And so these two groups here, the anterior group, they're dealing with emotions and they're kind of sending information back and forth to the limbic system. They're, they're, they're not back and forth, but they're sending information to the uh, limbic system. They're the relay station to the limbic system. The ventral group down here, this is the group that we, um, that pretty much receives all that other sensory information that I was talking about, except for a couple of the special senses, but all that somatic information, pain, temperature, vibration, fine touch, crude touch, all of that stuff is going into the ventral group and then it's gonna go up to the cerebrum. Right. Okay. Then we have um, this posterior group, which contains <clears throat> an area that we call the pulvinar. Um, but what I want you to know here is that in the pulvinar, we have these two bodies. One is called the medial geniculate, and the other one is called the lateral geniculate. Okay, so we've got the medial and the lateral geniculate. Now these areas, I don't want you to confuse them with a colliculi, okay? These areas are going to receive visual and auditory information. 
Not, not like, a, it's not a reflex. So they're just receiving anything that you're, that you're seeing that's coming in through your eyes is going to go back um, to the lateral geniculate. So the lateral geniculate is vision, right? Because I said all sensory information. So what you're seeing goes back to the lateral geniculate and then it's gonna go back to the visual cortex. That's just the point that it stops. The medial geniculate, this is your auditory information. That's your auditory information. So anything you hear has to stop in the thalamus first before it goes up to the cortex, and it's going to stop in this medial geniculate. So let's think about this for a minute because this one doesn't make sense. If we wanted to make up, if we wanted to um, come up with a silly way to remember this, you would think that the lateral geniculate would be the visual. It's not. The lateral geniculate is, um, I mean, you would think that the lateral geniculate would be auditory. It's not. The lateral geniculate is visual. The medial geniculate is um, auditory. So it's kind of exactly opposite of what you would try to come up with to remember it. Does that make sense? Okay. So I'm just trying to give you ways to try to remember these things. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> So when, you know, your ears are lateral, right? So you would think that anything you would be hearing would go into the lateral geniculate. But it doesn't. It goes into the medial geniculate. And your eyes are more medial, so you would think that anything you were seeing would go back to the medial geniculate, but it doesn't. It goes to the lateral geniculate. So it's kind of opposite of how you would come up with something to memorize that. What? And we're going to take a break, okay? <laughs> So when we're looking at this picture here, um, we can see the hypothalamus. The thalamus sits right here. So that round thing right there is the hypothalamus. And then we have that, um, you know, the uh, third ventricle surrounding it. And then we have this area right beneath it. It's kind of like a, you know, triangular, rectangular, you know, sort of shape and that is the hypothalamus. Now, the hypothalamus has several different nuclei in it, several different centers and areas, and we're gonna go over all the functions of the hypothalamus. Okay, so here we go. First thing I'd like to say about the hypothalamus um, and the pituitary is that there's no blood-brain barrier surrounding this. This is an area of the brain where there's no blood-brain barrier. There's no blood-brain barrier around the pineal gland either because these areas work on negative feedback a lot. Um, and so the hypothalamus has to monitor what's going on in the blood. It needs to regulate hormonal levels in the blood so that it can determine if it's supposed to be sending out regulatory hormones or not, right? So no blood-brain barrier here. But when we look at this picture, we see, you know, this is the hypothalamus up here, right? And then we have this stalk, which we call the infundibulum. And then right below the infundibulum, we have the pituitary gland. And the pituitary gland is split up into an anterior and posterior with a little intermediate um, area right in between there, right? But we want to look at what's going on in the hypothalamus. So first of all, the hypothalamus... Um, it has, it has um, seven different functions to it, and so we're going to talk about each one of those. The first thing is that it releases two hormones. One is called oxytocin, and the other one is called ADH. So they're released from different areas on the hypothalamus, and they have different functions. So oxytocin, and this is simplistic because oxytocin has some other um, functions besides this, but we know in the female, oxytocin levels, um, they, when she's pregnant and she's going through labor, oxytocin levels raise up and that um, causes increased contractions and it causes her cervix to dilate. Okay. It has some other uh, functions that we know about, like um, helping a person to... Um, you know, increase um, 
their um, awareness or their um, focus and things like that. But you know, for our sake, we're going to just say that it is uh, that it, in the female, it causes uterine contractions and basically mammary gland contractions where it ejects the milk and it causes the contractions of the uterus and the cervix to dilate, okay? In the male, it has a function too. It's released to help the, the ducts in the male reproductive tract um, squeeze and push that sperm along, okay? So it, it's a contractor is what it does. Oxytocin is a contractor. It causes things to contract so think about that. Think about in the breast, if the breast glands, you know, think about them, you know, visually thinking of them contracting, it's going to eject the milk. In the uterus, it contracts and it ejects the baby. Okay. All right, so that's oxytocin. ADH, and we are going to talk about ADH in quite a bit of detail when we get to the urinary system. That's an antidiuretic hormone, so it causes you to retain water at the kidneys. You retain water. You reabsorb water. When ADH is released, your urine is going to be less volume and more concentrated because you're reabsorbing water. Okay? So that's one thing. The next thing is that um, the hypothalamus controls your body temperature. So this is one reason why it can't have that blood-brain barrier. That blood vessel has to go past the hypothalamus so that your hypothalamus can detect if your blood pressure is high or low. And then it's going to make adjustments based on that. Okay, it also has um, control center for some autonomic functions. So the autonomic functions, do I have them on here? Autonomic functions are going to be things like um, we have heart rate, uh, they, they affect these, blood pressure, respiration, digestion, which sounds a lot like your autonomic nervous system, doesn't it? So that is your center for your autonomic nervous system, right? That's where it, the control center for the autonomic nervous system. And those, um, the autonomic nervous system kind of works on a daily basis. It's constantly working, adjusting the hormones, right? Adjusting the, um, I should say, the neurotransmitters, which we'll talk about when we get to chapter 16. In addition to that, though, um, it will stimulate the fight or flight, uh, what we call sympathetic activation. And this is a little, it's kind of different than the, what I said with the autonomic function because in autonomic function, one or two glands might be stimulated, right? But in sympathetic activation, all the glands, all of the effectors are going to be stimulated when you have sympathetic activation. So that's a little bit different than just autonomic regulation. Okay, it also controls... Um, Skeletal muscles um, subconsciously. So, um, yeah, I don't know why I don't have this, but um, subconscious. Motor function. Especially when you're talking about really strong, um, strong emotions like rage, pleasure, pain. So what I mean by that is, you know, when you're in a lot of pain and your face goes, oh, that's a subconscious um, motor function, right? That happens subconsciously. When a person is sexually aroused and their, their body um, writhes, right, that is where that's controlled in the hypothalamus. Okay, um, the other thing that happens in here that you need to know about are... There are these um, feeding reflexes, licking and swallowing, right? Licking and swallowing. And the last thing is that um, you have emotions and behavioral drives. Like there's a center that um, will tell you when you're thirsty, 
It'll tell you when you're hungry. It'll tell you when you're full. Okay? So those centers are in the hypothalamus as well. All right, so we've got all those things going on in the hypothalamus. And in addition to that, it also releases these inhibitory and releasing hormones that are going to control the anterior pituitary. So there's just a lot going on in the hypothalamus. It's really super important, right? It's a very important area of the brain. The next area of the brain we call the limbic system. So when we look at the limbic system um, from the front, this all this colored area in here, this is all the limbic system. <clears throat> This whole thing. I'll get to that drawing in just a second here. All right, so we've got all of that. Um, if you look at it, in just one hemisphere, then it looks more like this. Um, but you can still see all of the colored area. So all of this colored area is part of the limbic system. And if you just look at the limbic system and take out all the rest of it, it looks kind of like, it looks like this. This is what the limbic system looks like, right? It's just all the colored area in there. So part of it is, you know, part of it's part of the cerebral cortex. Like this is a gyrus in the cerebral cortex up here. So part of it is in the cerebral cortex. Um, part of it we see, you know, as some of it's white matter, some of it's a little gray matter. So we, ha we see a, a, it just doesn't have a very clear definition of where it's at, right? No clear boundaries really. <clears throat> so what we want to do is we want to look at what the function of the limb system is. And there's only um, a couple of things I'm going to have you remember about this. Um, first, overall, the limbic system establishes your emotional state. Your emotional state tells you, you know, it, it's the one that's setting, you know, are you happy today? Are you angry today? Are you tired today? Are you? It's setting your emotional state, right? The other thing is that it links your conscious mind with your unconscious reactions. Right? Your conscious mind with your unconscious reactions. Okay? All right, so, um, and then the last thing that it does is it's an area for your memory to be stored and where you can retrieve that memory. So this is the area, say, that you, you know, you, you went to prom and you heard this great song at prom and you had all this wonderful, you know, thoughts about prom and then prom was 10 years ago, right? Every time you hear that song, now it elicits certain reactions and certain emotions within you. Right? So it's, it's kind of pulling memory out and then making you have emotions about that. Okay? Um, it's also where like addictions occur. Right? Um, this is where addictions become established because a person has a drug and then it makes them feel good and then um, their limbic system says, I want that feeling again. And so then they have more. It takes more drug to make them feel um, that good again. So this is kind of where addictions are established. But there's a couple of areas that I want you to know about. So first of all, we have this area that's called the hippocampus. So the hippocampus is this area down here. And as it, it's like this biggest, fattest part of what we call the dentate nucleus. And the hippocampus, it, it resembles a seahorse. It's important in the retrieval, uh, the storage and retrieval of long-term memories, right? 
So in a person that has dementia or Alzheimer's, this one's usually pretty intact for a long time because they can remember their driver's tests, you know, to get their driver's license. They can remember their kids' names. They can remember, they can remember these things for a long time. They can remember how to drive for a long time until that area starts to get damaged. Another area that I want you to know about is the amygdala or the amygdaloid body. And we see that right here. I should have done a different color right there. That's the amygdaloid body or the am amygdala. And this one is going to um, regulate your heart rate during fear and anxiety. So it takes over. All those other areas like the medulla and those other areas we we're talking about increasing heart rate, this one takes over when you're really afraid or really anxious and your heart starts beating really fast. Okay. It also helps to control that sympathetic fight or flight response. So like I told you before, there's a real gray line between the, hip, the hypothalamus and the, um, the limbic system. You know, they kind of share, you know, and then the, and then the um, thalamus is sending information to the limbic system. So there's, there's some really unclear areas and some shared responsibilities there. And then also, like I said, it links your emotions with your memories. So certain memories will elicit certain emotions. Okay. All right. Um, then there's the fornix, but uh, we're going to just leave the fornix alone. So those are the only two ones in the limbic system I really want you to, to know. So now we're going to head into the cerebrum. And the cerebrum is the biggest area of the brain. And we're going to look at the different parts of it. So first of all, one of the confusing things, we know what the lobes are. I know you guys know what the lobes are. We have the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, and the temporal lobe, right? So we know what all those lobes are. There is, um, and then we have these sulcus, these sulci. So sulci are deep indentations where gyri are just like near, really shallow indentations, okay? So we have this one indentation that's called the central sulcus, it's a pretty deep sulcus, and it's very distinct. It's not curvy. It just kind of goes straight down. Um, it's a pretty distinct sulci, sulcus that you can see. Anything in front of that sulcus is the frontal, or frontal lobe. Anything behind it is the parietal lobe until you get down to where the occipital lobe is. right? So it's that central sulcus that divides the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe. In addition to that, we had the lateral sulcus, and the lateral sulcus divides the temporal lobe from the frontal lobe. Okay, So when we're looking at the sulcus, we can see that there's a gyrus right in front of the central sulcus and a gyrus right behind the central sulcus. The gyrus right in front of the central sulcus is called the precentral gyrus because it's in front of it, so it's the precentral gyrus. That's physically what it is. Functionally, it is the primary motor cortex. <clears throat> and it has a map on it that we call the homunculus. You guys remember the homunculus? It's a distorted body map, right? So it's got the hands and the feet and the legs. So it's a distorted body map. Okay. A motor map, they call it now, I guess, not a homunculus. They call it a motor map. Because if you touch it right where it's mapped out for the nose, then the nose would wiggle. If you touch it right where it's mapped out for the little finger, then the little finger would wiggle. Right? So that's, it's, a, it's mapped out, the motor map. Right behind the central sulcus, we have a gyrus back here that is called the post-central gyrus, right? That makes sense. It's behind the central sulcus, so it's the post-central gyrus. 
That's what it does, that's its name anatomically. And then um, functionally, its name is the primary somatosensory cortex. Okay, somatosensory cortex, primary somatosensory cortex. This also is mapped out with a, a distorted map, a somatosensory map, right? I'm not doing it to the way it's supposed to, but it's a distorted map of the body. And so if you feel something on your nose, that information's gonna go up to your nose where it's mapped out on there. If you feel it on your little finger, it's going to go, you know, that's where that sensory information is going to. When, when your sensory information finally gets here to this primary somatosensory cortex, that's when you are aware of what is happening. Up until then, it's really not in your awareness. You're not aware of the, the sensation, okay? So the sensations that come in here, though, are not the special senses. The sensations that come up into this primary somatosensory cortex are all your general senses. So your, um, your, your pain, your temperature, your vibration, your touch, you know, all of those sensations, all the general sensation, sensations end up there, okay? And the primary motor cortex over here, um, this is only for voluntary muscle control. So when you voluntarily lift your arm, it's coming from that area. It's voluntary muscle. Okay. You might hear in your nursing career or in your careers um, that the primary motor cortex is also called the pyramidal system because the neurons in there look like little pyramids. So whenever you hear, I don't know if it's on the NCLEX or whatever, if they've taken that off, but the pyramidal system, when you hear that, you just know that that is voluntary muscle movement. It's your voluntarily moving the muscles. That's the pyramidal system, okay? That's the primary cortex. Right? Okay. Um, let me see. I want to check your lab list here to see if we need to know, if you have to know all of those sulci. So you do have to know the central sulcus, frontal lobe, parietal lobe, lateral sulcus, temporal lobe, parieto occipital sulcus. So this sulcus back here is the parietal occipital sulcus. So you have to know that on your lab exam. The occipital lobe. Okay. All right. So here's the deal with the, um, the cerebrum. The outside of the cerebrum is gray matter. And then we have some white matter in there that connects the two cerebral hemispheres together. And then deep to that, we have more gray matter. Right? So um, you need to identify areas in the gray matter. Like you have to identify the precentral gyrus and the postcentral gyrus. You have to identify um, other um, special corte cortex areas. So let's see where we're going to go from here. All right, so let's look in here really quick. I'm gonna show you. Um, so the outside here, this is all the cortex. That's the cerebral cortex. And then we can see some white matter in here. This is the corpus callosum that attaches the two cerebral hemispheres together. <coughs> and then there's some other um, fibers that connect the um, hemispheres together. I wanna to show you that picture next. And just be brief about it here. Have on my notes, we're going to look at the, the white matter quick. 
Okay, so there are some, um, the white matter then is going to contain myelinated axons. And the myelinated axons are just connecting um, different areas of the brain together. Sometimes it's connecting lobe to lobe, sometimes it's connecting within one lobe, and sometimes it's connecting the right hemisphere to the left hemisphere. <laughs> so let's look at the different types that we have here of these um, projection of these fibers. We have, first of all, um, we have the association fibers. And in this picture, where are the association fibers? Yeah, oh, we're seeing... Yeah, I'm not going to go into a lot of these um, at all. I think I have a picture of it, don't I? On the, yeah, yeah, here it is. So we're just going to keep this really short here, right? So the, um, the fibers that are called arcuate fibers, they're really short, and they're just going to be connecting um, one area of one lobe to another area in that same lobe. We have um, longitudinal fibers that are going to connect one lobe to another lobe, right? And then we have the other fibers that are called um, uh, the commissural fibers, and those are the corpus callosum and the anterior commissure, and those are connecting the right to the left hemisphere, right? Right to the left hemisphere. All right, now we're going to look deep. Deep inside that, the brain, you know, you've got the gray matter, then the white matter, and then deep to that we have a gray matter again um, that contains a structure that looks kind of like this. It looks like this, right? And we, um, so you guys, it, it used to, and in our lab exams, you had to be able to identify these, and we've taken a lot of these things out, which is really good, <laughs> because I don't, I don't, you, the main thing is you need to know what the structure is and what it does. So the main structure in this gray area is called the basal nuclei. Well, yeah, it's the basal nuclei. They used to call it the basal ganglia when I was in school, but ganglia are in the peripheral nervous system, nuclei are in the central nervous system, so basically it's the basal nuclei, okay? Basal nucleus. Okay, so um, the, the thing that the basal nucleus does is that it, um, it helps to, it's subconscious control of your skeletal muscle tone, it, and it coordinates um, learned movement patterns. So it sounds a little bit like the cerebellum, right? So it, it is um, subconscious control. And it coordinates learned muscle patterns. All right. So it doesn't um, it doesn't start a subconscious movement like it doesn't start you walking, but once you start walking, it keeps you walking. It 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 has that um, that learned um, motor. You know, it's like a learned motor pattern, right? So it releases, um, it's going to release like acetylcholine. And if it were left alone and it just kept releasing this acetylcholine, it would just, it would make your muscles overactive, right? And you would have a, a tremor because your muscles would be constantly moving, right? But it's inhibited by dopamine. Where was dopamine from? Substantia nigra, right? It's from the substantia nigra. That's where dopamine is from. So dopamine inhibits this basal ganglia, 
so that it takes away all that extra motion and it keeps your motion really smooth. So you'd have tremors, you'd have a really stiff gait, right? You'd shuffle if you didn't have dopamine inhibiting the basal ganglia, right? Okay, so it's important, it doesn't initiate movement, but once movement is underway, it's going to provide the pattern to that movement. And the big thing is, is that it's um, inhibited by dopamine, right? So this is a problem with Parkinson's disease. So we just want to make sure that we have, you know, we remember that. So in Parkinson's, dopamine doesn't inhibit it? The thing in Parkinson's is that um, the substantia nigra is not putting out dopamine. Okay. So now you have no dopamine, you have nothing controlling the basal ganglia, it just, or the basal nuclei, sorry, and it just goes crazy and causes all sorts of rigid muscles. It makes your muscles tight and rigid, and then you're, you know, tremoring, um, just too much contraction. We have to control the contractions in the body with dopamine, okay? Okay, um, next we're going to look at the cerebral cortex, is that there is... Uh, I told you already, there's lateralization, a little more in depth. All right, and I already told you some of the things here. I told you about the general senses. I told you about the um, primary motor cortex, which is the precentral gyrus, that's primary motor. I talked about the primary somatosensory that's in the post-central gyrus. So I've already talked about those two. Now I want to talk about the special senses because the special senses have to go somewhere, right? They go to the, um, all of them except for olfactory, go to the thalamus first and then they go to your cerebral cortex so you can be conscious of what you're, you're, you're um, sensing, basically. So we have, in the occipital lobe, we have the visual cortex. So where in the thalamus did we say visual information went? Lateral, Lateral geniculate, right? Then we also have the auditory cortex. And where in the thalamus is that coming from? Medial geniculate, right? Okay, good. All right, um, we also have, and so once they get to these areas, then all of a sudden you become aware that, oh, you just saw something, or oh, you just heard something, right? So they're helping to make you aware. We also have an area um, right here in the, in the um, temporal lobe called the olfactory cortex. So everything you're smelling goes back through the olfactory nerve directly to that olfactory cortex. It does not stop in the thalamus. That's the only one that doesn't stop in the thalamus. Okay. Then we have the gustatory cortex, which is in the frontal lobe. So the gustatory cortex is the um, anything that you're tasting first goes back to that thalamus, and then it's going to go up to that gustatory cortex. So it's important for you to know where these special senses um, cortices are. You know, what lobe are they in? Gustatory is in the frontal, olfactory is in the temporal, auditory is in the temporal, visual is in the occipital, somatosensory is in the, in the parietal, primary motor is in the frontal. So just know what lobes they're in, all right? And then know what they're receiving, which is in the name, right? Now, in addition to those, um, we have these things that are called the um, association areas. And the association areas help you to interpret whatever information came in. So we have a couple of different, um, we, have, we have several different sensory 
association areas, and then we have one motor association area. So let's first look at the sensory association areas, right? So right next to, and they're going to be found right next to these special cortex areas. So here's, again, this is our primary somatosensory cortex. Remember, this is where things like all of your general senses are coming up here. So your touch, vibration, pain, all those general senses are going right up there. And then the um, association area is right next to it. So this is the association area. So it's called the somatosensory association area, right? Somatosensory association area. Okay. Um, so this is going to interpret whatever it is that you're that you're um, touching. It interprets whatever you're touching. Right. Um, so some people that have um, agnosia, you know, if they had a stroke and now they've <laughs> damaged that area and they have agnosia, they'll have a really hard time at the sink trying to figure out, you know, like what's what are they touching? You know, what is that? What are they touching? Okay. Then we have another association area back here that's next to the visual association area, uh, visual cortex. So we call this the visual association area. So that's visual association area. And that's going to interpret um, whatever you see. So it helps you to recognize letters and words. This is where you learn how to read, right? You, you can be looking at letters, but unless your, this visual association area is working, you won't even be able to know that a C is a C, and that an A is an A, and that a T is a T, and that they spell cat, right? So your, your, your language, um, your ability to read is developed here. If you have damage to that area, you'll see symbols, but it'll mean nothing. Just symbols. You just see something, but you have no idea what it, what it says. Then we have um, an auditory association area right here. The auditory association area is um, it, it is going to, again, interpret what you hear. So it helps you to recognize words, right? You recognize words. If a person has damage to this area, then they're going to be able to speak, but it's going to sound like nonsense. They, they're going to... Um, they're going to come up with words that just don't even make sense. I hat tomorrow for sunshine. You know, so the, the words come out clearly, but nothing ties together, nothing makes sense. They can't find the right words when they're speaking, if there's damage to that area. Okay, so those are our um, association areas for sensory. Then we have a motor association area, and if you remember that gyrus right in front of the central sulcus, that precentral gyrus, we said was the primary motor cortex. That's up here is not a 10, it's a one with a little prime. So it's a primary motor cortex. And the association area is right in front of that. Okay, it's right in front of that. And this is, um, it stores learned patterns of movements. It stores your learned movements. It stores it. It's your muscle memory. You know, we always talk about muscle memory. So when you're learning to juggle, it's really hard at first, and pretty soon it's pretty easy, right? You learn to play the piano. It's kind of tough at first, but then after a while it becomes pretty easy. It's because this association area, this primary motor 
it's not primary motor, it's, it's the motor association area, um, helps to store that information, store that pattern of movement. Okay, so those are the association areas. They interpret, all of them interpret what is going on in those primary areas. Okay, then we have the um, integrative areas. And the integrative areas are, um, they're, they're usually lateralized to one cerebral hemisphere. So like in the right or the left, but not in both. And there's only a few of them that I want you to know about. So we have, first of all, um, the general interpretive area right here. You can see that it's kind of in the parietal lobe, goes a little bit into the temporal lobe. It used to be called Wernicke's, but I'm sure you know we wanted to get rid of the, the um, person that found it. So it used to be called Wernicke's, but now we just call it the general interpretive area. It's only in the left hemisphere. Okay. Um, and it helps to comprehend language. That's one of the things that it does. So anyway, these, let me tell you, these, in, in, these um, um, in, integrative centers, they're receiving information from the association areas. So they receive information about whatever you're interpreting that you heard or see or feel, and they're receiving all that information from those interpretive areas, or those um, association areas. And then they have to come up with a motor response. So they bring in that, that information, and then they try to coordinate a motor response. That's basically what these integrative areas are doing. So for instance, Wernicke's area is going to receive information from your visual and auditory association areas. Whatever you're seeing, whatever you're hearing, and it will develop a response. So I, I said this in general A&P. For those of you that um, weren't in my general A&P, I'll tell the story again. Um, there was a book out there called A Man That Mistook His Wife for a Hat, and he was a um, great musician. And then as he got older, he started to have some problems with his brain, and his friend was a great um, psychiatrist, uh, and a neuro, um, you know, neurologist, psychiatrist kind of combined and brought him into his office. And this man just couldn't, he, he, heard, what his, he heard what his friend was telling him, um, but he couldn't, he couldn't, and he knew what he had to do, but he couldn't get his body to do that, the command correct. So at the end of the visit, the doctor would say, okay, you can go ahead and put on your hat and you and your wife could leave. And so he would reach over to grab his wife and try to put her on his head because he was getting the information, but then this integrative area, this interpretive area, wouldn't allow him to come up with the right motor command to, to do it, right? So there was a disconnect between what he was in, in comprehending and what he was trying to do, okay? So that's basically, that's why it's the general interpretive because of, um, of that, it's, it's a disconnect. Then we have the speech area here, and the speech area is, used to be called Brokaw's area, so you might still hear it as that. Brokaw's area is the one that uh, is your motor speech area. It's your speech area that helps you to produce speech. Again, it's only in the left hemisphere. And so um, if there's damage to that area, you the message still goes down to your muscles in your throat and so you can make sounds but you can't you can't make words come out and so a person will grunt uh 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 so they they grunt right so that's different than the auditory association area where we said they can say words because there's nothing wrong with Brokaw's center but their words don't make sense so there's a difference between those two all right, so that's Brokaw's area. And then finally, we have the um, prefrontal cortex. So the prefrontal cortex right here, um, that is one that um, it does a couple of things. It helps you to plan. It helps you to predict consequences. 
It helps you to reason. It helps you to judge. And this is what we say, we tell people that's not fully developed until a person is 25 years of age. Right, 25 years of age. It's one of the reasons why we have the, um, you know, like the drinking age is 21, right? It wants that prefrontal cortex to be more developed before we let people have, make their own decisions and reason as to whether they should be drinking or how much they should be drinking, right? Um, so there's that. There's also, if there's damage to this free, uh, prefrontal cortex, a person just becomes really flat, just real flat, like no emotion, no nothing. Um, if it's damaged, they can't answer questions like, you know, well, what, tell me, tell me how long ago that happened. When did that happen? They can't, they have no, they can't reason or judge when was that? When, you know, when did that happen? Okay. A, a lot of times they still do these things too. If a person is, um, really, if, if there's a criminal uh, or if there's a person that is, has super high anxiety, like um, to the effect where they cannot do any of their activities of daily living, they will still do the electric shock therapy. They don't call it that anymore, but electrical shock where they'll shock that um, and try to bring them out of that um, funk, right? They're trying to shock those so that a person can predict, reason, judge, plan, and they can at least do their activities of daily living. Criminals, when they get super um, violent, they'll do that too. And they still do a prefrontal lobotomy too where they'll take a section out. And again, that person becomes real flat. Very severe cases, though not often done. Okay. We're almost done here, and then we're going to take a break and go over the, the cranial nerves. The last thing I wanted to just tell you about the cerebrum, um, right, there's lateralization. So there's, um, you know, your right side of your brain is a little bit different than your left side of the brain. And, you know, we don't have to go into that too far in depth. Um, the right hemisphere is good for math, um, writing, spatial relationships. Uh, so. You don't have to know the difference between the two, but you do need to know that Wernicke's, Brokaw's area, those are both in the left hemisphere. You should know that. Um, but math, writing, spatial relationships, those are in the right hemisphere. So, All right. Um, that's it. I did have something on about an EEG, and that's just where they're, you know, that's, that's something I'm not even going to put on the test, but that's where they're just looking at your brain waves um, to see if they're normal or not, okay? That's it.